Now says there'll be daily four-hour pauses starting from today. It comes after discussions between U.S. and Israeli officials in recent days, including talks U.S. President Joe Biden had with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The U.S. says it will allow people to get out of harm's way and for deliveries of humanitarian aid. The Supreme Court is set to give its decision on whether a government plan to deport asylum seekers to Rwanda is lawful. The Court of Appeal ruled in June the plan to deport those seeking asylum to the East African nation was unlawful. The Home Office challenged that ruling last month. The decision on the challenge is expected to be made on Wednesday. And the Queen has commemorated the nation's war dead at a ceremony at Westminster Abbey's Field of Remembrance. Camilla paid tribute and recognised the sacrifices of those who fought and died for their country in her first visit to the Abbey since the coronation. After placing the cross down, Camilla and hundreds of veterans fell silent as the chimes of Big Ben rang out. This is GB News across the UK, on TV, in your car, on your digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying play GB News. Now it's back to headliners. Hello and welcome to Headliners, your first look at Friday's newspapers. I'm Stephen Allen and helping me on this journey of emotional discovery, we have top comedians Paul Cox and Cressida Wen. Cox and Wen, nope, no jokes I can think of there, so we can just move on. How are you doing both? Great, Steve. How are you, Cress? I'm very well. I've had a lovely day. I've been hanging out with my dad. Oh, yeah. okay. Very nice. Talking of dads, you've met my dad, haven't you? I have. That's he true. He speaks a lot of you, actually. Really? Yeah. This relationship is really going faster than I expected. <laughs> I've started to meet the parents already. Uh, I've got two dads now. <laughs> like that is it? Oh, hang on. What? I'm not what? slightly older than you. Like That's three not... years older. That's how it works, is it not? I thought it was a Lewis joke, and it just took me. A no, second. no, no. My it's dad, a Steve my joke. dad and Steve has met Steve. Wow. If you start calling me daddy, this show's going to get weird, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, right, let's move on to those front pages. The Daily Mail, come for Suella and you come for us all, is their front page. The Guardian, pressure grows on Sunak to sack Braverman uh, over clash with police. The Telegraph goes with Sunak faces calls to sack Braverman. Uh, the I, sack me if you dare. Braverman defies PM's authority. Let's see if there's a pattern. The Daily Express, Suella's future teeters on the brink. And Daily Star, normally they go with something else. Nope, we asked 100 people who was the most bat bleep crazy Home Secretary we've ever seen and our survey said... Actually, we don't know. It could be anyone, couldn't it? Uh, and those are... Oh, let's look at those are your front pages. <laughs> Let's get stuck in. Let's begin with the Daily Mail, Paul. Yes, the Daily Mail, Steve. Come for Suella and you come for us all. I think she speaks for us all there, don't they? Don't they, the Daily Mail? Um, so this is Rishi Sunak uh, was last night warned for a mutiny uh, on the Tory right if they sack Suella Braverman. So this comes on the back of an article that she wrote today in The Times in which she criticised the police, saying that they had favourites. Not without some justification, I would say. I mean, there has been demonstrable evidence online where they've... Essentially, there have been people with British flags have been asked to take them down by the police, and they point pointed out, well, what about those thousand people over there? And they've gone, well, there's a bit too many of them, so we're going to ask you to do it, if you don't mind. And I think that's roughly what she's talking to. But the bigger picture here is that Suella Bravham is probably one of the few Conservatives in the Conservative Party now, and she speaks from a Conservative perspective. She's always doing this. This is not out of character. This isn't, some, this isn't someone who is surprising us at all. And people are jumping all over it, which is surprising me slightly, because it's not out of character. The one thing she may have done wrong is that she... Uh, I think the story uh, for parliamentary rules has run past the Prime Minister's office. He didn't, uh, he didn't agree the original wording, but the original wording got published. Yeah. And also, Cressida, how about this? As a, just to throw some, you know, balance and all of this in here, um, if you are, I don't know, in charge of the police, Home Secretary, for example, and you've got some beef with the police, you very much can pick up the phone and tell the police about it rather than writing about it in a <laughs> national newspaper. That's the best bit. That's my favourite bit of the whole story, that she's gone rogue. 
I think this, this is going to this is going to do great things for her in the long term. Everyone. The other thing, of course, is I mean, it's saying Rishi here's upset, but he's, Rishi's not upset at all. This is this Rishi would like to be able Rishi would like to have the trousers to be able to say this sort of thing about the Met Police because he essentially tried yesterday by saying, "Yeah, do what you like." But if it goes wrong, it's on you. Yeah. That was that was that was the same as what she's saying, except she was just more pointed, and and probably more accurate. Do you think she is trying to get fired? Loads of newspapers are kind of hinting at that that somehow she it would play in the long run, as you say, Cressida. Well, like that... temporarily fired, just to come back as a massive legend. She gone yeah. Andrew Tate? Is that the temporarily the idea? Fired come back as a massive time. legend. Well, I don't know. To to, <laughs> to bring out that. I mean, I just saw that clip on the news. Sadiq Khan blaming everything on her, saying. Her, beha her behavior. She needs to think about what she's done. Her behavior is causing uh, what did he call it? Uh, division between us. Now, really, is it is it Suella that we should be blaming for I that? I mean, he says that in the same sentence as saying that everybody who's going to come on Sunday from the other side is EDL and. Mm. Um, so he's sowing some more division. Well, of course he is. But what about collective responsibility, though? That, that if you are such a high, uh, high up the rank um, secretary of state. You should be singing from the same hymn sheet. You're causing division in government. You're making Rishi Sunak look weak, and that's not going to necessarily win votes. No, I agree. I do agree on that point. I think there is no cohesion, and there probably should be a lot more. Um, there's always going to be that sort of tension between government and police, particularly in these situations when both can get the blame. And there's some posturing at the moment and uh, some manoeuvring to make sure that if it does go slightly wrong on Sunday... Uh, and Saturday, let's hope it doesn't. But if it does, then the government are going to just turn around and say, we told you so. It's so reasonable, Paul. But no, but it's... <laughs> It'll never catch on. <laughs> uh, so let's move on to The Guardian. What have they gone with, Cressida? Um, they've got Brave Moon as well, obviously. Uh, they've also got ceasefire deal to free hostages was rejected by Israeli PM. So The Guardian is saying that sometime before, much closer to the 7th of October, there was already an offer from uh, Hamas to release some hostages. We don't know how many, and that's the crucial thing, for a ceasefire. And Netanyahu turned it down. But we don't know how many. So there was 240 people taken. If he's gone, go on, then we'll give you a couple of people. It's not fair, is it? I, so that information is in this article. It's also such a huge story that they shouldn't say things like according to closes, according to sources familiar with the negotiations. That's the sort of line you expect when they're talking about Jordan or Sam Fox. <laughs> this is this is this is not Gaza is you know Gaza Israel. I think this is pure speculation from the Guardian. I think they've taken they've, they've taken a, a potentially valid piece of journalism and spun it for what they want. Um, I I mean, Netanyahu, Netanyahu is not the most liked man, even amongst the Jewish people. But I can't believe that, let's say, uh, the Hamas were going to offer all hostages back. I can't believe you'd turn no, that they, down. Well, they yeah, but that, that, uh, yeah. we're nowhere near that. They're now talking about releasing the women and children. Um, and it turns out there's Israeli people campaigning outside his front door, apparently, for him to get involved in the negotiations. I thought the idea was bring everyone home, no one forgotten. But... Mm. I don't know. And I suppose this is in contrast to the, the news that we hear about this four hour, whatever the phrase is, that's not ceasefire, yeah. this ceasing of firing temporarily for four hours. But it's because the Americans got involved. And for all of the, the MPs in this country say, oh no, Keir Starmer must say this, wouldn't have made a difference what he says. It makes a difference what America says. Well, that's absolutely right, isn't it? I mean, I think the four hour humanitarian break. That's the phrase. Uh, is. It's good. I mean, how could you say anything else? Um, it's not a ceasefire, of course, but it's allowing humanitarian, humanitarian aid into Gaza, which, as we can see, is much needed, no matter what side you fall down on or whether you're in the middle or whatever, you know that they need to get aid in there. So that's a good thing. Uh, we'll just see where that goes. This... None of this looks good to me. Yeah, I'm sure we'll come back to this story at some point. Moving on to the Telegraph, Paul. Yes, a COVID vaccine compensation scheme must be reformed, former ministers urge. So this is Zadim Sahawi and Sir Jeremy Wright urging the government to examine payments over delays and limited support for people harmed by COVID vaccines. So this is families affected by COVID vaccine forced to take legal action because, because of limited sums awarded by official governments. 
compensation schemes. And uh, whilst this is on the front page of The Telegraph, and there's a lot going on in the world at the moment, um, I would say this is a very big story because we've got the COVID inquiry going on, and I don't think the COVID inquiry has got the right line of attack at all, and we'll come to that a bit later. But this is one of the... Well, this is why value-add can really come from the aftermath of COVID. To suggest that, for instance, COVID vaccines were good for everybody is nonsense. We all know that. We knew that before we were going in because there was, a, there was an element of risk to it all. Whether you were for vaccines, against vaccines, you knew yeah. that... We, we knew that was true of vaccines. Yes, COVID exactly. Was even a thing. So I wish they'd be more you open. Try a small amount of a vaccine first, don't you? You don't say let's give this to the entire population at an yeah. enormous cost to the taxpayer and see how it goes. You know, you'd. I think they should have begun with really vulnerable people, and by that I mean very old or very sick people, where maybe it could have done some some good and not rolling out to children as quickly as they possibly get completely so, unnecessary exactly and they took away autonomy to some degree so they all say no we give everyone a choice but nobody really felt like they had a choice because at that time if we can cast our minds back and i've forgotten a lot of it to be honest three years ago now but at that moment in time you felt a, you felt like you wanted the vaccine because um, well, i did that was my personal perspective because i thought this might be the way out of this mm. and b if you didn't have it you felt like you were going to be restricted from a whole raft of things going forward holiday Days, eating out, what, going to the pub, whatever it might be. So this was forced upon large amounts of the population and therefore we should probably look at a great deal of compensation if people were injured. Mm. Yeah, and it's, it, it does come down to the amount of money because it's not enough, is it? I mean, if you have a vaccine that does some huge amount of good, but, and that's an if before everyone starts tweeting, <laughs> and, and, and you have a vaccine that causes three people to have the kind of injuries that means they can't work, you've got to pay the money that corrects that damage. And that's, that should be part of realising, you know, the risk-cost-benefit analysis. But presumably this is the tip of the iceberg because yeah, thought... so many... I mean, if, if it hurts a few people, the scale of this means that it's just going to cost... Um... Well, that's, that's why I think this is such a big story, because it's been hidden for political optical reasons. Mm. Well, let's end this section with the Daily Star, Cressida. What's their take? Back to Suella. Uh, we asked 100 people who was the most bat, SH, asterisk, T, uh, crazy Home Secretary we've ever seen. Our survey said, but I've only got the front page. So it's difficult to tell. Uh, there's Dennis, by the way. Home Secretary. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, there, there's Theresa May, there's, uh, there's uh, Pretty Patel, who was giving evidence at the COVID inquiry. And what's really interesting about that is one of the things that Pretty Patel said was that the Home Secretary is not in charge of telling the police where to police and who to arrest. Oh, that's an awkward thing to say right now, isn't it? Oh, that's, that's so well has hated that. I bet she did. Mm. Yeah, um, I mean... It, I bet it drove her crazy. Uh, and, and going back to that story, that's why there is this conflict between the Mayor of London and Central Government, because Mayor of London does have jurisdiction over the Metropolitan Police, which is, is the police force that are going to be managing whatever happens over the weekend. I don't... Th I think this is slightly unfair on... So well. I just think it's very easy pickings to say she's... Uh, bat crazy. Um, we were thinking of saying uh, guano instead of bat. Beep. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. What, I, I very nearly said it then. Yeah. And, uh, guano crazy is a good phrase as well. Yeah. Guano crazy, man. Yeah, guano I crazy. <laughs> now, now I feel like I apologise for that. You never know. It might be on the list. We'll, we'll check in the break. But that's it for part one. In part two, we are talking no fault evictions and Boris Johnson, but no, not in the same story. Mm. We're here for the show. More energy this time! Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. <laughs> Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's News Channel.
People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament, but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10 a.m. till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB+, Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Headliners. We're in part two and Suella hasn't been sacked yet. If you're watching the repeat, we don't know. Um, <laughs> we're still here with Paul Cox and Cressida Wetton. <laughs> to the independent Paul, and it seems Boris Johnson wanted bigger fines for breaking lockdown rules, which would have one day cost whichever party donor he uh, got to pay his. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Boris Johnson wanted bigger fines for COVID rule breakers inquiry reveal. So this is Boris, Boris Johnson, uh, the famous... Well, you remember Boris, don't you? Oh, yeah. Uh, colleague, our colleague. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'll take <laughs> it back. Like, oh, he's not. I've yeah, he forgotten already. Yeah. Uh, 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 so Boris, for, <laughs> break, uh, for, he wanted higher fines uh, for COVID rule breakers as he unwound the first lockdown back in August 2020, just weeks after his own rule breaking. And there was there's a fascinating piece in here from the lead counsel of the inquiry, which is Hugo Keith. KC, asked former Home Secretary Dame Pretty Patel uh, to put aside the crushing irony of Mr Johnson's note. So, I mean, I'm not sure... It doesn't sound very professional of me. He's added, like, <laughs> he's added his own emotion into the proceedings, which I think lends itself to what I'm about to say, because... I think this I think this this inquiry is on a on a path to getting us absolutely nowhere. I mean this stuff I guess is vaguely important but I don't care. I don't think ultimately history cares um, whether the fines were higher or lower or took place or whether uh, Boris had cake or at a party. Now, I know that upsets a lot of people to say that, but I genuinely don't care about that. Um, what I do care is about getting some value out of this particular inquiry, because we've got an opportunity now, whilst we're close enough to it in time, to look at what we could have done better. And the first thing we should look at, the first question we should ask, is do lockdowns work? And that doesn't seem... That seems to have been skirted round at every turn at the moment, and it's not, it's just not happening. So this story for me in The Independent is kind of not independent of thought and it's just an opportunity to have a dig at Boris and we already knew Boris was a bit of a war Wally. But, Sorry, mate. Well, I mean, yeah, did he really want them? Did he just fancy it that morning when they asked him? I don't know. Yeah. Um, the trolley. <laughs> well, okay. You said earlier that you'd, you'd already forgotten things that were going on. I think this is all smoke and mirrors, all a filibuster so that we don't get to exactly as you said, do lockdowns work? And every other day on Headliners, we do a story about some other problem that happened because of the lockdowns. And I don't think it matters whether you believe or don't believe in lockdowns. Lockdown was our only method until we got the vaccine to manage this. Now, did we need to? Because there was a massive economical and mental health impact because of the lockdowns. Did it work? Didn't it work? If there's evidence that it kind of worked, then maybe we would do it again. Not in my lifetime, but maybe we would. But, you know... There, there are arguments that maybe we wouldn't have taken that path if that wasn't what China did, because you don't want to seem to be not copying the place that did it. There are arguments about do it quicker, but 
but shorter. And you're right, none of these questions are being asked. It's all about, what did Boris do? What's he like? What did Dominic Cummings... Which swear word was that? Ooh. But <laughs> the, also, the flip side would be, it's like a five-part inquiry, and this is part two or something. By the time they get to episode five, Miami Beach, <laughs> they'll... Uh, they'll run out of... The COVID they'll, wives. They'll accidentally ask good questions, because they'll have run out of questions to ask. I Nothing hope so, like, Steve. Maybe. You know, you never know. Uh, the Mirror, Cressida, and this story has the police, the poppy and Rishi in it, but it's not the one you think. Cops find no evidence Poppy Seller was attacked by protesters despite Rishi Sunak's blast. So it turns out, according to the police, the chap who claims he was punched when he was selling poppies, they don't say he wasn't punched, they say there is insufficient evidence. So I don't know. I, it doesn't seem like something he would be lying about, but I don't know him personally. Um, so Chief Constable... Uh, sorry, Assistant Chief Constable Sean O'Callaghan said extensive review of CCTV footage and the identification of key witnesses found no reason to believe that poppy sellers are at any risk of being intentionally targeted. That's a weird way of phrasing it, isn't it? Yeah, I think... And it's also, it's also nonsense. It's the sort of thing you'd expect from the mirror at the moment. Um, uh, one thing I would say is there's a huge difference between no evidence, which it says in the headline, and insufficient evidence. There's a massive gap between those two yeah. things. I, I could believe there was insufficient evidence. There was quite the melee. It was a big crowd. It was in Waverley Station, Edinburgh, which all three of us all know quite well. well. I'm a bit worried about some of these witnesses as well. I mean, there's a chance they might not be on his side. Well, well <laughs> that's a good point, Chris, because every, every single person there, other than the, the one person that helped him out, which was a member of station staff, was part of the protest, and it's not in their yeah. interest. They did review CCTV. Yes. But we don't know if there was a good view. I'm reading the whole article, it would be nice I've... to know that. But they, they checked the footage through all that period and did not see it happen on the CCTV. No, and I can't see it happen either in that footage. One thing I would say is it was intimidating for him. He was a poppy seller. And you know, it's not the best thing to be as a poppy seller in the middle of a... Uh, pro-Palestine uh, protest. That's just fact. The two, the two worlds do collide and clash there, hence why we've got concerns about this weekend. But it was intimidating for him, and he is there, he is there all the time. This guy goes there and he leaves at 3pm every day. This was at 2, 2.30 in the afternoon, and he felt like he had to leave. They said that someone, he said that someone trod in his stuff. He's an 80-year-old, 78-year-old man. I think he has... We have reason to believe him. Whether it was a punch in the face is another matter. OK, let's so move on to The Times, Paul. And the BBC, the state propaganda outlet, has done what propaganda outlets always do and admitted it got it wrong and apologised. Can't be right. Yeah, always after the fact as well, isn't it? Rather than trying to get it right in the first place. Very easily done. Um, B... Uh, B... I can't say it. BBC admits to British... I believe it's pronounced <laughs> that way. Yeah. The <laughs> BBC. Ba -ba 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 <laughs> But, but, uh, um, anyway, apparently it's pronounced <laughs> lightning rod. Yeah, BBC admits to Brit to British Jews, just to British Jews, it was made it made mistakes in Israel Gaza, Gaza coverage. So this is the BBC admitting mistakes in its coverage of the war between Israel and Hamas, but denied accusations of systematic uh, uh, systematic anti-Semitism, which I find really interesting statement because it's not saying it, it's not saying it wasn't anti-Semitic. It's just saying it's not built into their system to be anti-Semitic, and of course. Of course, uh, there is no confusion here, because if we, we just have to take ourselves back to the 7th of October. We all saw the scenes, we all saw there was rape, murder and pillage, and we all knew that it was done by Hamas. So then to just spend the next three weeks calling Hamas activists, like friendly well, union you, you leaders... You know why they don't use the word terrorist. I do. You can disagree with that decision, but you know that they didn't say, let's have a meeting, should we take a vote on it, should we call these terrorists, we've decided no, let's not do it. That's, and that's the narrative that's been sold. Like, how, why aren't they calling these people the terrorists? Because they've made a stupid decision to call no-one terrorists. Yes, and that is an important point, Steve, absolutely, because that has got lost in the argument. And it's got lost with me sometimes. I, you know, I've been very critical of the BBC over this particular thing, and I've never mentioned that. And um, until today, I wasn't actually aware of that process. However, it Not, did it take so, a long time. It did take a long time. The other thing they've agreed on is fact-checking, isn't it? And that comes up again in here, the mistake, the yeah. mistake we all know about. And they've said that they, this has all brought about a change. We've started to write headlines by putting who is making a particular claim first. 
But this comes how much longer since they... When did they start doing their fact-checking campaign? That's it's months well, it's ago, got, isn't it? They were... Well, the Verify thing was a month ago. Before that, there was the misinformation reporter, which is kind of the same sort of deal. The one thing I did hear someone saying that it's because we now live in a time when most people get their news from push notifications. <laughs> yeah. So, actually, if you don't write that headline... The headline was the, the afterthought. You write the article and then the headline. And if you get that wrong, you've really made a mistake these days because that's where people get the news from. So that's where they're really dropping the ball as well. Yeah, and it's like news isn't news isn't a commodity to sell, particularly when it's when it's this. I mean, arguably it is. I mean, I think, I mean I think by the way, by the room. Yeah, hang, hang about. This is my job, okay? But it's it's, I think what I'm trying to say is, uh, particularly with Israel Gaza. Um, they don't. They, they can spend time getting it right. Yeah. It, that push message doesn't have to be catchy. Yeah. Good point. Um, the Independent, Cressida. We have no fault divorces, but we get a ban on no fault evictions. So if you want to get rid of a tenant, best bet, marry them. Smart. Nice. <laughs> Smart. No fault evictions hit seven year high amid government delays to ban. So I'm not sure if we are getting this or not. It's, it's all up, everything to play for. Um, the number of landlords, so it's gone up a lot. The number, number of landlords pursuing no fault evictions against their tenants is at its highest for seven years, new figures show. So there's been more than 8,300 Section 21 evictions, known as no fault evictions, uh, because the landlord doesn't have to give a specific reason. And that's uh, from July to September this year, which is a massive increase on last year. It's up 37.9%. Um, is this cost of living crisis causing people to bring their properties back uh, from the market? I don't know. Mm. Um, uh, and this week, the, the King's speech has, has included some stuff. And obviously, you know, the King knows loads about landlord and tenant law, doesn't he? <laughs> that's, that's the person you want to go to to hear about that. Um, but anyway, it's not going to be brought in yet, uh, and, and the King is still talking about landlords will benefit from reforms to provide certainty that they can regain their properties when needed. So on the one hand, you've got people saying, we can't have people thrown out on the streets, and on the other hand, people saying, well, we can't just have landlords being forced to give up their properties. What's going to happen? Well, there's probably a very good reason why it's happening right now, is because they fear it's going to come in. It's, it's not illegal to do it right now, so they're thinking if they get rid of, if they get rid of people now, then you know they can they can increase their their rents and they can get rid of difficult people now before it becomes impossible to get rid of difficult people. Because we often forget when we're having this debate that um, you know that landlords exist in this argument also, and we even need to accept that. We don't have any public renting, private renting, sorry, or we just accept that landlords own property and pretty much they can do as they wish with that within the rules. Now, I know that seems terribly unfair and a bit Dickensian of me to say, well, you know, uh, let's get rid of the surplus and poor or whatever. <laughs> it's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is... It's... You're going into politics. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm Suella, I'm Suella Braverman's speechwriter. <laughs> um, but, 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 but I would say there are two sides to this and they're not doing anything illegal right now and it, it is unfair, but... Do you know what? Risking it is very risky. It's a very risky move to rent privately. It is. It's, it's... Oh, the interest rates going up. Yeah, I guess it really changes things. You've still got a contract, though, haven't you? So I yeah. can't really understand why, if everyone's acting within the rules of the contract. But nothing's illegal in this. That's the point at the moment. I think that's yeah. why they're doing it now before it becomes illegal. Should it do? Let's try and do a quick hit on this one. Maybe it won't take long, but to the Telegraph, Paul, and at a Beyoncé concert, cameras were trained on paedophiles. So very much like an old episode of Top of the Pops. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't work there, though, did they? They were trained on them, but they didn't, they didn't accomplish anything. Beyoncé concert audience scanned for paedophiles using facial recognition technology. So this was in South Wales back in May. The South Wales Police reveals it's policing first. It is In a policing first, it is using tech to target sex offenders at events that attract large numbers of children. Now, normally, at this point, I would say, oh, no, I don't like too much, you know, incursion, invasion from technology into, pro into personal lives, but the opposite argument is you actually want paedophiles in pop concerts, and I don't. So I, I don't think that's think a good that's thing. The <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine Beyonce in South Wales. I think that's brilliant. Um, <laughs> I wonder how she feels about this branding. Like... Well, she probably didn't know, did she? I doubt I don't it was a request. <laughs> Like, can I have uh, peeled strawberries and no paedophiles? I just wouldn't <laughs> oh, want to be associated with <laughs> uh, Well, that's it for part two. Coming up, we'll be talking about the King, the Pope and Ofcom. So we'll definitely be respectful about at least one of those. We'll see you shortly. I'm Andrew Doyle. 
Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows... Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. Join me, Mark Dolan, Fridays and Saturdays from 9, Sundays from 10. Only on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. So join me, Nana a Queer, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday, where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Can you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Is it, 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 you? <laughs> it's on your teeth. It's on your teeth. It's, I, I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <laughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. We're here for the show. More energy this time. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Headliners to the Telegraph, Cressida. And someone's been praising migration, but he would. He comes from a long line of Germans. It's the king! It's the king. Uh, the king says refugees need to feel more welcome in... I can't do his voice. Um, in Britain. <laughs> that wasn't bad. Thank yeah. you. It's mainly me doing an impression of Eddie Izzard doing it. Anyway, um, as we've established, the king is an expert in landlord and tenant law, and he's also... Um, he's an expert in refugees as well now. So he's, he's hosted a humanitarian charities do at the palace, um, and that's his... This is his, his uh, takeaway pitch, is refugees need to feel more welcome. And he's, he's got all these ideas that, that they could contribute to society. Um, he, he's been talking to Michael Palin about this. Michael Palin says he's travelled the world a lot. I've travelled the world a lot. I suppose the refugees have as well, haven't they? They've all <laughs> they've got lots to talk about. I mean... Um, yeah. Will they be staying at the palace? Obviously, that's what we will want to know. Well, absolutely, they're not a good one. And, you know, I'd hate to say anything against His Majesty, so I know he watches, so sorry, sir. Um, but I think he's kind of wrong on this in the sense that we are one of the most welcoming countries in the world. We, we beat ourselves up about this all the time. Now... If you're a, a fighting age man, you come across in a rubber dinghy. You're probably not going to get the sort of welcome that the king would like like us all to give these people. But however, for anyone else who comes over here uh, seeking asylum and wants to work and wants to integrate and wants to become part of our nation and our the community that is Britain, I think we're very welcoming, and I think most of us are open to it. Some people, some people aren't, but there's, you know that's the same everywhere. Also, I get yeah, a little bit of balance. He was at a do about a refugee charity. He's not going to go, I'll tell you what. Goodbye. I reckon they He's should not Suella, that. is he? <laughs> Suella would. She'd turn up and say what she thought. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, the Guardian, Paul, and uh, 
Uh, trans people can be splashed with water so that we know that they're not witches. Is there any other info in this story? <laughs> there is some more info. I'll give it to you now. So this is in The Guardian. Now, The Guardian, who, by the way, are the only newspaper who don't have a poppy on the front page. I'm just going to point that out. Trans people can be baptised in church and be godparents, says Vatican. So uh, this is the Vatican office is adding that there must be no situations in which there is a risk of generating a public scandal. So this is something that's been signed off uh, by Pope Francis and was published on Wednesday. And uh, it says uh, that a transgender person, even if they have undergone hormone therapy and sex reassignment surgery, can receive baptism under the conditions as other faithful. So at this stage, I find I think that we're actually starting to invent things to argue about. Because I've never <laughs> at any point heard the I don't want trans people to be baptised argument. Well, I'm and glad you said that, because I naively thought, oh, I didn't know this was a problem. I, I assumed, because I thought, well, everyone's got a soul, haven't they, if you're, if you're religious. Um, I didn't, I really genuinely didn't realise. And also, the tone of it, it it's like, a, you know when someone says, oh, I really love that my kids, they're my world. You know, like, yeah, I just assumed you did until yeah, you started. Yeah. <laughs> now yeah, it's yeah, suspicious, yeah. you know. It's like that, isn't it? It says, uh, the document also noted that there was no reason transgender people could not serve as witnesses at church weddings. I should think so too! <laughs> Why would they not be able to do that? Yeah, it's like, I mean, next week, what's he going to say? Transgender people are allowed shoelaces. Exactly! <laughs> yeah. I mean, none of this makes any real sense Very other than... strange. I can't, I don't... It, the story doesn't say what triggered it. Um, I've no idea why anybody would argue against it. Um, You'll find out on Twitter later. Yes, so there we sure, go. Sure. Do you think this is, as usual with these religious institutions, they, the, kind of the numbers are dropping, so they do these kind of crazy moves to try and make try them go up or members. down, but sometimes it fails because people like the old-fashioned stuff. Well, of course, that's the idea of religion. It's quite old-fashioned. Some of it's <laughs> thousands of years old. <laughs> uh, to the Times, Cressida, and will Ofcom keep young people off social media? I'm tired of getting catfished by some oh. kids who <laughs> pretend to be a five-year-old trucker. You need to be very careful, Steve. Social media sites warned by Ofcom to do more to protect children. Um, so social media apps face an overhaul to protect children. We're hearing a lot about this at the moment. Uh, under a code unveiled by Ofcom, as the regulator warned sites connected to suicide and terrorism, uh, those sites will be blocked in Britain. Well, that sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah. That sounds great. Sounds very good. Um, I still don't always understand how they're going to ID these kids. Um, well, they says... never can, can they? Well, I don't know. I, mean, I for, guess we'll for find instance, out. Facebook's supposed to be for over 14s. Right. And there are plenty of under-14s on there. Um, just from my own experience, children, not, I have not done some census, just in case anyone's <laughs> worried. Um, but, I'm you know, more worried than from your experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Across just, this from my, just from family members, not, right, because I, not because I'm involved in some industry that we need to worry about. I mean, ultimately, what's going to happen here is we've got... This is very much from the perspective of our generation and older generations who never grew up with social media as part of their childhood. So we're doing our best to manage this in a, in, in a way that's alien to us. Ultimately, what's going to happen is the children now that are subjected to social media will be the people that come up with the best things yeah. to tackle this, but in a generation's time. So my daughter at 14, um, she, she hasn't had too many uh, troubles with social media, but you know, it must affect her in some way. And if, you, if, you're, if you're very susceptible to these sorts of things, they can be extremely damaging. So it's these people that are going to tell us in 10, 15 years' time what it is we can do, because we're kind of old and fuddy-duddy, aren't we? Yep, can't argue with that, sadly. Uh, the Daily Mail, Paul, and a creepy website where you can video chat with strangers is shutting down. So it turns <laughs> out I am free this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Omegle, which is something that was new to me. I don't know if it was new to you two. Omegle shuts down after 14 years. A creepy website that allowed users to video chat with random strangers closes amid claims it paired children with paedophiles. Doesn't sound like a good thing. Um, the site... The <laughs> it sounds like a dating app. But worse, well, this is it? it's even worse than Bumble or something. This is the point, isn't it? So the site which randomly paired you with strangers was partic particularly popular among children during the co you know, COVID lockdown. So it says it was a great way to meet new friends. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it was not. I mean, like you say, the internet is not the best way to meet new friends, is it's it? It's also Chris? a bit like working on headliners, isn't it? Here's two people you've got to get on with tonight. Go and do it. Yeah. It might be Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them have got a calendar and other merchants dies. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, who would have thought the internet was a place where creepy things would happen if you just let... I think I've seen it. it. It's like, you know, almost like a fruit machine where you would sit there and then it would spin around and there'd be someone there. Hi, and then you speak to them and inevitably... Um, Nude. If, yeah, yeah, just some oh, old guy with his pants. What? <laughs> 
<laughs> you get it could only go that way. I'm yeah. amazed it's last, lasted 14 years. Yeah, I know. How did it get past six months? Well, on to the Times, Cressida, and someone has finally, finally solved the problem of getting rid of that smell of a newborn baby. Oh, if there's one thing we wanted to get rid of. <laughs> <laughs> Dior's £230 designer scent for babies. Um, it's, it's got a grown-up price tag, hasn't it? I cool, think just say that for it. Um, so, finally, we've, we've got a, a baby perfume. The marketing's amazing. Inspired by the childlike spirit of courtier... Courtier? Courtier, I can't speak. Uh, couture perfumer Christian Dior Bonnetoile is scented water with notes that poetically evoke the magic of childhood. That's good, isn't it? Do you want to smell like the magic of childhood? No, that seems well, as creepy as going on a website. <laughs> 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 we can see the, the picture thing. there. Look at that. What the advert looks like. They look terrified. She <laughs> does. Look at her. She's been trafficked. <laughs> 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 terrifying stuff. I don't know what to do with that. You floored me. This gets rid of the smell of traffic. No. Um, it's, well, it's, come on, it's, it's silly, isn't it? I yeah. wanted to bypass the inevitable orange blossom that has so long been the signature of child... I... I've often wondered if we could evolve too far. And this, and, <laughs> and this, and this might just be it. I mean, what's the point in this? A, yeah. a £230 design of perfume for babies. Yeah, but if you've got a new baby, you can drop an extra 200 quid on just smelly stuff. Man. You're doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah they do smelly it. stuff for free, Steve. As you <laughs> <know>. <laughs> they do indeed. <laughs> uh, that's it for part three in the final section. Robots attacking humans, an actual female cyborg, and we're all living in the Matrix. Is it all from the Daily Star? Find out soon. Who is it? We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. Tired of the usual focus tested, pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? In your mouth. OK. Here comes, a, here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Whoa! Whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows... Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. Join me, Mark Dolan, Fridays and Saturdays from 9, Sundays from 10. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
Welcome back to Headliners to the Daily Star, Paul. And if you weren't worried about robots ending humans, well, you will now. Yeah, I've always been worried, and now I'm even more worried. So, robot crushes factory worker dead after mistaking him for a box of vegetables. Uh, uh, sorry for laughing. It's a very serious story. Uh, a robotic uh, company worker has died after a machine he was inspecting failed to differentiate between him and a box of peppers, pushing him into a conveyor belt and crushing his face. So this is obviously quite harrowing, and this is just further proof that science is bad, Steve, isn't it? This is a terrible <laughs> story. This is, um, this is it, somehow worse yeah. than the Terminator because of how gross it's this is. This so bad. Yeah. And Lewis is going to say vegetables were bad for you, which is equally annoying. <laughs> yeah. oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. It's terrible. I mean, it's, it, we've started. No, haven't we? It's, it's. This is it. We keep every week. All the AI is it going to get us? Yes. Well, it's not very good, is it? If it can't differentiate between... Uh, basically, what I want to know is what he looked like to get mixed up. <laughs> not after, you not after, Steve. Absolutely never. Oh, I'm not victim goodness. blaming the crushed face, man. I'm just saying, how can he get mixed up with a box of peppers? <sighs> Thinking he might have dressed slightly. Yeah. Like the T-shirt was the Red Hot like, Chili Peppers know, logo. Maybe he like... had, like, a comic relief T-shirt on with, like, a red <laughs> a red, <laughs> oh, a red oh, nose oh, on it. I thought, no. oh, these are not the peppers. Uh, oh, dear. I'm, oh, I'm horrified. I'm, I'm not easily horrified. That. Uh, to the Daily Mail, Cressida. And there is an actual cyborg woman who's got a chip implanted so that one of her hands can unlock doors and her other hand can vibrate. And if your hand can vibrate, you don't need to unlock doors. <laughs> what are you laughing at? You're not <laughs> leaving the house. I love it. Love it, Steve. Meet the world's <laughs> ultimate cyborg. California woman has 52 implants in her body that allow her to open locks and turn on computers. And Steve, while well, one <laughs> even causes her hand to vibrate. Nice. We've done that part of the joke now, yeah. Um, so she, I'm really sexist, as you know, and I would have thought the first person <laughs> to have 52 cyborg implants would have been a bloke. Yeah. Which is quite, and I'm, you know. That's really interesting, actually, isn't it? I mean, yes. she's a magician on some sort of yeah. conjurer or something. Yeah, she's, she's uh, an anomalous. So she can't go shopping every time she tries to walk past the security <laughs> thing. <laughs> beep, beep. Here we go again. It must have, I mean, it says something interesting here. It says about half the implants are microchips, uh, which she programs to give herself heightened senses and abilities, such as opening locks and turning on computers. I mean, I have turned on a lot of computers and none of them have given me the old... Uh... The old... Uh... <laughs> do you not do the thing when... I know this is a bit London-centric, but when you use your Oyster card during winter, you just slip it inside your glove oh. so you can feel like Iron Man when you're going through. No, <laughs> but I will 100% be doing that? It's pretty cool. Maybe even tonight. Yeah, <laughs> but you don't have to implant yourself with 52... No. Is this the future? Well, and worse than that, she has to keep checking them, so she has to presumably take them out of her body. <laughs> Ugh. And they have to be checked because they've got these uh, chemical things on the outside that, you know, it can't go wrong. Yeah. But she's the pioneer, so it might go wrong. And also, on this, what I love about the internet at the moment is generally there are people who hate eco stuff who say Bill Gates is trying to put chips in us all. And then literally Elon Musk is making electric cars and putting chips in people, and they love a bit of him. So this whole area is a bit messy these days, isn't it? Um, the Daily Star, Paul, and are we living in a simulation? And if so, why did they program us so that men have nipples? <laughs> it's, that is a really good question. It's quite deep, actually. Um, another, another story from the Daily Star, big time tonight. Impossible to rule out humans living in Matrix-style, thought-controlled simulation. So the latest claims from Google's artificial intelligence intelligence-powered large language model, BARD, uh, states that humans might be living in a fake world where every thought is controlled. I can, I can believe that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think we've seen Checks evidence of it all over the news every day of the week, don't we? People do seem to be controlled. But, of course, it's not out the realms of... My, nearly everything is possible. You can't... You, you just can't rule anything out. Yeah. Brilliant. Cressida, hot oh, take look, on this? I mean, it's nearly 20 years since I took philosophy, and uh, this is, like, first year... You know, I thought I'd wasted my time and all my money, but it's all come to fruition today. Yeah, this is, this is possible. Descartes and all that. The argument that I hate about the idea that we're, we're more likely to be living in a simulation bothers me. Then the, the argument goes, it's easier to make a simulation than it is to make a universe. So if there's an infinite amount of time, more simulations would have been meant, um, uh, built. So statistically, we're more likely to be in... in uh, simulation. You're timesing by infinity, though. It's not how math Well, of course, works. and, you know, monkeys and Shakespeare and all that sort of stuff. What, are, what we always seem to be doing here... <laughs> there, there is some logic to that. I'm, <laughs> um, but, <laughs> I'm not just saying random words. It's like, yeah, monkeys these things are possible next. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they're all, they always seem to be arguing that there can't be a god by arguing that there 
could be an artificial god. <laughs> Good point. Star Trek 1, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. um, to the Times now, Cressida and speed dating for dogs, not to be sniffed at. How cute. Date my dog. Can I find a match for my Whippet Pim? <laughs> How <laughs> sweet is this to start with? I like um, it. I'm looking for a stud. Handsome, excellent pedigree with true blue leanings. I'm sure you are, but what about the story? <laughs> <laughs> Not for me, you understand. My dog, Pimlico Betts Derbyshire. Oh, my <laughs> God. That's ridiculous. Um, and this dog is uh, a very expensive dog. She comes from a long line of other expensive dogs. Uh, probably all got terrible health problems. And so she's She's looking for for somebody to, who's got a stud dog for her dog. Uh, but really, it's her partner, Terence. And Terence has seen that there's people in other parts of the world making thousands of pounds. And this is where it all stops getting cute. Really, these people are just jumped up puppy farmers. Boo! Uh, adopt, don't Yeah, agreed. Shot. I mean... <laughs> The dog needs to be rescued from its owners at this point, I think. <laughs> Dogs don't need to date. Dogs aren't posh. They just need a ruffle and a scruffle, Steve, and, yeah. and, and, and a kip. The, no, what, I, dating I like dogs. The sound of that. <laughs> I mean, I like a ruffle and a scruffle. I don't know if you do, Steve. Yeah, uh, the kip sounds better. Uh, yeah, the kip does yeah. sound good, actually. No dog is called Pimlico Bet Starbucks, not even this one. That's ridiculous. <laughs> no. Is it sponsored by the plumbers? <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. If you oh, have... they'll be upset by that, won't they? <laughs> they, won't, they won't have thought of that. I guarantee it. Kennel Club dogs have these long names, don't they? I, I was this just is a whippet as well. I like whippets. Well, yeah, uh, nothing against whippets. That's not my point at all. I'm pro the whippet. I just. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't suggesting you were. It's just... like we'd had an argument backstage. They're doing the maths in the third paragraph about how they can make three grand out of a dog. No, no, have a cheap dog. I had yeah, a cheap dog, you and you couldn't get any more love out. They're just they're great. You don't need an expensive one, and you get health problems if you start inbreeding. Is he gone? And I'm from the West Country. Has he gone? Mm. Yes. Oh, this is oh, the time. What did you do? You oh, tell me. I wish I'd have broke in before you actually got to that. <laughs> just all just think about dead dogs. <laughs> Uh, to The Guardian, finally, Paul, and uh, oh, a tongue yeah. twister could be the new breathalyzer test. Well, as I always say, I'm not a pheasant plucker, I'm a pheasant plucker, son. I'm only plucking pheasants till the pheasant plucker comes. Whoa! And, um, well must be done, drunk. Steve. Drunk that, 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 was super. TV. <laughs> that was super. All the way through that, I was sweating, thinking, is he going to? Is he going to? <laughs> Never worked again. Uh, <laughs> tongue twisters could be used to gauge alcohol intoxication levels, study finds. Well, I don't need to read anything else here, because, of course... <laughs> Of course, of course it doesn't, right? The only way that could work is if you tested them sober. Yeah. You need a baseline. You can't just wander up to people and get them to do tongue twisters if they're drunk. They might not have been able to do them when they were sober. <laughs> so you'd just be arresting everybody in the, in the back of the van, sir. Oh, I'll talk about all There's loads up. of drunk newsreaders driving around London. <laughs> Give them a go. Look, there's, we, the producer here went to quite some trouble of um, giving us a whole bunch of tongue twisters. Now, I'm going to try one. Fr Fred Fed. Ted bread and Ted fed Fred bread. Very good. Nice. Crescent. All uh, single syllable words there. Yeah, that's what I went for. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's yes. exactly what I went for, it, Chris. So I'd like you to do one of the other ones if you don't Which mind. Which one would we've got? Do the sick, we? sick one. The six, sick, sick, shakes, six, sheep, sick. What? None of those words are written down there, Chris, no. but congratulations for giving it a go. Lesser, leather, never, weathered, wetter, weather better. Okay. <laughs> you're actually on the, you're right at, uh, let's just carry on until one o'clock this morning with this yeah. shall we? we've got a minute left to fill so, well, uh, this is like when josh tries to make us staple the documents as a race and i just struggle because i haven't got that sporty thing i don't care so you were actually reading one that i didn't know was there but there is one here look sick six sick hicks nick six slick bricks with picks and sticks very good uh, I slit the sheet. <laughs> very good. <laughs> for primaries. <laughs> oh, do I get a badge, Mrs. Wetton? Mrs. <laughs> Miss. Thank you very much, Paul. The story much, Paul. is that I mean, do we? Can we we've, we've we've invented the breath. Yeah, the breath yeah, there is no need, need for this. this. Where is it? It's in the Guardian. It's in the Guardian. <laughs> well, you... well, actually, we've had more stories that make sense from the Star tonight than the Guardian. Yeah, wow. Well, that's always saying something. The yeah, but you're right. If you can have the ability to do these in the first place. Then you're never going to drive down the street without being arrested. You'll be in prison all the time. It's all fun for the police, though, and I know they're having a recruitment problem. So you know this might this might encourage people. That's true. Uh, well, the show is nearly over, so let's take another look at Friday's front pages. The Daily Mail: Come for Suella, and you come for us all. <laughs>
Uh, the Guardian goes with pressure grows on Sunak to sack Braverman over clash with police. The Telegraph, Sunak faces calls to sack Braverman. You see the pattern forming again. The I, sack me if you dare. Braverman defies PM's authority, the Daily Express, as well as future teeters on the brink. And the Daily Star even says, we asked 100 people who was the most guano, but crazy <laughs> home secretary <laughs> as we've ever seen. And our survey said they probably mean Suella. That's all we've got time for then. Thank you to my guests, Paul Cox and Cressida Wetton. Uh, we're back tomorrow at 11 when Andrew will be joined by Nick Dixon and Bruce Devlin. And if you're watching uh, the 5am, stay at uh, the repeat. Stay tuned for breakfast on the way. I have yourself a good one and we'll see you soon. Who is it? We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus, on the Smart Speaker app, and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to 